Hello friends, Kofi here and welcome back to my YouTube channel, Tutor Med, where everything medicine is simplified. Kindly support us by liking and sharing our videos and then subscribing to our channel. So in today's video, we will look at the last part of the urine dipstick. In the previous video, we ended with leukocyte esteries, explained what it was and what it indicated when positive. Now let's look at the rest of the parameters of the urine dipstick. And so the next parameter is nitrites. So many enteric bacterial species like E. coli, which commonly cause urinary tract infection, have nitrate reductase, an enzyme which converts urine nitrates to nitrites. And so if you have nitrites in your urine or your dipstick test nitrite, it means that this enteric bacterial species are there probably from a UTI. However, it can have false negatives. If you have a UTI caused by an organism that does not have this enzyme, there may be UTI, but the nitrite should be negative, like Pseudomonas and then Neisseria. Another false negative cause is a urine which has not stayed in bladder long enough, it has stayed in bladder less than 4 hours. Literature says that the nitrite might be falsely negative. Then we have a urine pH less than 6 and then low urinary excretion of nitrates. If there is no nitrates in the urine, even if there is E. coli, it can't convert the nitrate to nitrites. And so together with the leukocyte esteris, the nitrites indicate um, the presence of a UTI. But as mentioned earlier, if you have a UTI caused by pseudomonas, Leukocyte esterase may be positive because there are white cells, but the nitrite might be negative because the pseudomonas does not have the nitrate reductase. Now we turn our minds to proteins or albumin. If a patient has proteinuria, it could be because there is albumin in the urine or a non-albumin like beta-2 microglobulin or immunoglobulin lichens. Now the standard urine dipstick is sensitive comparatively to albumin than the other proteins and so this means that a negative dipstick does not mean that there is no protein in urine. It could be as a result of the other non-albumin proteins. We will look at how to approach a patient with proteinuria in another video but generally proteinuria can be glomerular proteinuria which is as a result of glomerular damage could be as a result of tubular proteinuria as a result of which is as a result of tubular dysfunction leading to the tubules inability to reabsorb small proteins it could be due to overflow proteinuria and this is normally due to spillage the blood is made up of or the blood at that point contains a lot of proteins and so those proteins spilled into the renal system Example is someone who has rhabdomyolysis and has a lot of myoglobin in the blood. And so myoglobin spills into the renal system and you have myoglobinuria. So that myoglobinuria is an overflow of proteinuria. Then we have a post-renal proteinuria, which is as a result or can be as a result of UTIs, tumors, etc. Now of these, glomerular proteinuria produces the albuminuria. The last produce non-albumin proteinuria and so how then do we identify the non-albumin proteinuria we use a test called sulfosalicylic acid test abbreviated as ssa we will not look at that into details now because we are still focusing on urine dipstick but the point here is that if a dipstick reports proteinuria a positive proteinuria then the protein likely is albumin And so while granting the fact that the standard dipstick is relatively sensitive to albumin, it is important to note that it only picks albuminuria if it is at least 20 mg per dl in urine. What this means is that any value less than that would produce negative proteinuria, whereas there is actually albumin in the urine. So looking at the glomerular causes, we have nephrotic or nephritic syndrome can give you a positive protein um, on the dipstick. 
you have DM or diabetic nephropathy, and then some causes of chronic kidney disease. The albumin may be falsely positive if a urine has a high pH, if the urine is very concentrated, and sometimes if there's a prior use of a radio-opaque contrast material in some investigation of a source. And then sometimes a very dilute urine can give you a false negative result. And so now urine pH is the next parameter we will look at. The kidneys are one of the organs which maintain a normal acid-base balance in the body, aside the lungs. They do so by excreting acids into the urine when necessary. The physiologic pH of urine is 4.5 to 8.0. And the urine pH most often is used clinically when patients have metabolic acidosis. Take for an instance a patient with type 1 diabetes mellitus who has developed diabetic ketoacidosis. So because of the acidosis in the blood, the kidneys will try to restore the acid-base balance by excreting more hydrogen into the urine. So when, by so doing, it lowers the urine pH. Now a higher pH of the urine may suggest renal tubular acidosis. This is a condition where the renal tubules fail to excrete hydrogen ions into the urine because they themselves are damaged. Now remember that in our previous videos, we established that a urine abnormality does not necessarily mean that the problem is from the kidneys. Remember that. And so if someone has a high urine pH, it may be that there is an infection with a urease producing microbe like Proteus. And then this urease in this microbe is able to break down urea into ammonia. And since ammonia is basic, it's able to raise the pH of the urine, although the urine acidification from the kidneys was normal. And so a high pH does not necessarily mean that the kidney didn't do its job. It could be that there was an infection in the um, urinary tract, I wanted to say. Next, bilirubin. Now to cut the story of bilirubin metabolism short, it is produced predominantly from hemoglobin, first as unconjugated bilirubin, and then sent to the liver where it becomes conjugated bilirubin. Then it is excreted into the biliary system, then into the GI lumen, and there gut bacteria breaks the conjugated bilirubin down into some products, some of which are passed out to the feces and some of which are absorbed. And so bilirubin can exist as unconjugated or conjugated. The unconjugated form is not water soluble and as such it has to be bound to plasma proteins to be carried along in plasma. And remember that once a substance is bound to protein, it cannot be freely filtered by the glomerulus. Conjugated bilirubin is water soluble and so it doesn't need any plasma protein to carry it about or around and so it can be filtered, freely filtered, into the urine. And so presence of bilirubin in urine is bilirubinuria, and understandably, this is the conjugated form. Now, causes of hepatic and post-hepatic jaundice can lead to high conjugated bilirubinuria, and this, sorry, high conjugated bilirubin, and this would cause bilirubinuria. Then neurobilinogen. Now remember we said that the conjugated bilirubin is broken down into some products. Eurobilinogen is one of them and it's actually one of the products which is reabsorbed. And so eurobilinogen is a colorless byproduct of bilirubin metabolism by gut bacteria. Like stated, it is absorbed into blood and a fraction is excreted by the kidneys into the urine. And so usually, we should see some urobilinogen in the urine. Urobilinogen in the urine is often interpreted alongside with urine bilirubin to make sense clinically. So, as an illustration, let's look at obstructive jaundice. Obstructive jaundice can be caused by a variety of 
conditions like impacted gallstones, pancreatic head carcinomas, etc. Now in this condition, remember from the cycle of bilirubin metabolism, we said that unconjugated bilirubin comes to the liver to be conjugated and then they are finally excreted through the biliary system. And so if you have an obstructive jaundice or a post-hepatic jaundice, something blocking the biliary system, what would happen is that the liver has produced its conjugated bilirubin. And so we are expecting that the conjugated bilirubin is excreted, but it gets built up because of the obstruction. And so the conjugated bilirubin now finds itself in the serum or in the blood. And so here, you would expect that the patient would have a positive bilirubin urea. Then, concerning urobilinogen, urobilinogen will be absent because there is no bilirubin to get into the gut to be broken down by the gut bacteria into urobilinogen. And so urobilinogen will be absent. Now, standard urine dipsticks cannot distinguish between a normal and an absent urobilinogen. So when a standard dipstick gives you a normal urobilinogen, it could be that it's absent. But the point here is that the obstruct in obstructive jaundice patients would have a positive bilirubin urea and then an absent urobilinogen. And so we come to our last parameter on the dipstick, ketones. Now guys, kindly break here and then have some time to like and share our videos and then subscribe if you haven't done that yet. And so for ketones, one of the reasons you find ketones in blood, or sorry, in urine, is diabetic, commonly diabetic ketoacidosis. And sometimes prolonged starvation can also give you ketones. And then if someone has abused alcohol, alcoholic ketosis can also give you ketones in the urine. And so this brings us to the end of urine dipstick, the second component of urinalysis. Thank you for watching and see you in our next video which would feature urine microscopy, the third and then final part of urinalysis. Bye.